Asian Hercules II, that is. A 125 meter tall floating crane, one of the largest in the world. It's so powerful, it could lift more than a dozen leg sections at once. But attaching the leg section to the crane is a huge job in itself. So they call in the Spider-Men. Workers use harnesses or scaffolding for protection when they're high above the ground. But these men are specially trained and climb the 30-meter ladder freely. Once they reach the platform high above the shipyard, the Spider-Men wrangle thick cables hanging from the crane and shackle them to each corner of the leg. Then it's back down to terra firma. And we have liftoff. Dangling from the monster crane, the 34-meter leg section looks like a child's toy. As the crane approaches, a crew on board the oil rig rushes to prepare for the new leg section. Finally, contact, and the workers align the new leg section with the old. Now the two must be attached permanently, with invulnerable welds. In the coming weeks, they'll keep adding sections, until the legs tower 130 meters into the air. That's almost as tall as the Great Pyramid in Egypt. But it will take a lot more than just adding leg sections to finish this rig, and the deadline is looming. At the shipyard in Singapore, there's only five months left till the deadline. The main deck of the new rig is a mess of steel and scaffolding, and below, crucial equipment and supplies have yet to be installed. There's a crushing amount of work to do, and there's a rookie in charge. This is Brian Lowe's first stint as project superintendent. Careful, uh. Start with the outside first. The superintendent has to oversee all the workers and make sure they get the rig completed in time. While in the dry dock, a workforce of more than 800 people was dedicated to this one rig. But the superintendent has been given only 300 workers to complete the job and he's anxious about it. we got to push our people. Our operation is 24 hours. You see, so sometimes our men are working late. We have night shift coming in. So, to be honest, I'm a bit worried as well, even during my sleep. Managing a job this massive is nerve-wracking under the best conditions. Brian has to be everywhere at once. Okay, just hold up. Okay, okay. So later I'll call Will Wilson from, uh, you teach your people how to open the temple, then you can run the agent. The area, and he's not sure his workers have enough time between now and the deadline to do everything. Like transform this raw steel box into a seagoing hotel for 122 people and finish the mess room, which must feed more than 50 hungry rig workers at a time, with a kitchen worthy of a fine restaurant. And then there's the drill floor. It's still just a skeleton with the drilling machinery dangling in an empty derrick. But as long as there's oil down there, the frantic pace will not let up. Back in the North Sea, on the Noble Peat oil rig, the drilling continues. The drill bit is now turning more than 3,500 meters beneath the rig, and the work has reached another critical point. The bit is nearing two pockets of extremely high-pressure salt water. If they pierce one, salt water will shoot up the hole, possibly destroying the well and exploding up at the rig. Noel Shembri has to guide his drill between these two danger zones. By adding or removing weight from the drill pipe, he can steer the drill bit at the bottom of the hole and change its course. But when the drill is more than three kilometers away, he's essentially navigating in the dark. His only guidance comes from a probe near the bit that transmits its location and direction. But suddenly, Noel loses the probe signal. It flatlines. Yeah, we're getting nothing down here at the moment, so... Noel's team has no way to know how close the drill is to the dangerous high-pressure pockets. So they immediately halt drilling. They run tests, 
hoping that it's just a computer glitch. But there's still no signal. Uh, you can see the, the pressure when the pressure is going down. Yeah. Yeah. So the trouble isn't the software. It's the probe at the bottom of the hole 3,500 meters away. It's, yeah, it's the tool that's not reacting. Incredibly, they have to haul the pipe back up out of the well, all 400 lengths, for the second time in three days. Eight long hours later, the last pipe which holds the probe surfaces. But the $700,000 probe is stuck inside. It's high-tech equipment, so they try to be gentle. But the probe won't budge. So they have no choice but to get serious with it. Right. Finally, it's out. But there's no time to fix it. Fortunately, there's a spare. Twelve hours later, the drill, with a new probe, is back up and running at the bottom of the hole. And the probe is working. Its signal reveals that the drill is moving right between the danger zones, threading the needle perfectly. So as long as we keep away from these two floating blocks, number one and number two, we should actually carry on just to the perfect job there. Yeah. But they still have 300 meters to go before they reach their target. Luckily, the broken probe is their last obstacle. Several days later, the Noble Pete strikes a reservoir of natural gas. It will take up to two weeks to retract the drill pipe and replace it with a concrete lining. Then the well will be connected to a pipeline leading to shore. The Noble Pete's mission will be complete. And it will be jacked down off the permanent platform and towed to its next assignment somewhere else in the harsh North Sea. Back in Singapore, after more than two years of constant deadline pressure, the new oil rig is finished, on time and on budget. Its legs tower 150 meters above the water. Tugs are towing it out to sea. It's beginning a voyage to its first assignment off the western coast of Australia. When it gets there, it will jack up and go to work at a rate of up to $105,000 per day. But the Singapore shipyard can't rest, not for a moment, because the world's thirst for oil and gas only grows. And it's forcing shipyards to build ever tougher and more efficient megastructures of the deep.